Well, I t- I wear it. They I might be a little it, old. They might be a little. I too wear old it as a that. badge of honor anymore because I feel like the values that make me cringe to my daughter are things that need to come back. They need to be standard, mm-hmm. right? Making eye contact, talking to people you don't know to find a little bit more about them. Like I think that's important. Yeah. So if she thinks it's cringe, I think it's probably important. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, how about that? Am I cringe? Are we rolling? Am I cringe? You sometimes, <laughs> just on the notes you leave me, but we won't go into those. But I absolutely love those. Uh-huh. They make my day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cringe, cringe. They're pretty like fun. Word. Cringe is uh, it's a strong word when it's coming from your thirteen year old. You know it was cringe. Hmm. I was on Facebook last night and watching people argue. That was cringe. Yeah, <laughs> it's always. I'm always like this. Ooh, ooh, listen. I might have got into it. A but little. I enjoy I, it. Just like uh, I, I had say to myself every hair time. hair left, yeah. I'd have been, it'd have been gone. Okay, well, I usually say to myself, I'm never drinking again. And, you know, here I am. Just like I'm, I'm never Facebook arguing again. Mm-hmm. Well, there I was. I'm so. never eating a whole pizza again. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> I was but there. see, I so for someone who I'm like that meme, that Michael Jackson meme, who's sitting back eating popcorn watching because oh, yeah. I don't necessarily want to get involved because I know 99 percent of the time nothing's going to get resolved there. It's just an arguing forum. Yes. So I'm like, do I really want to waste my breath? And then not even waste my breath, but even if I'm saying something of worth, do I want to have to wait for that next comment so I can say my rebuttal? Which I just don't want to spend that much time rebutting something with someone yes. that it's never going to get through, right? Yes. I prefer the John Stewart popcorn eating meme, but um, I also <laughs> Okay. Yeah. yeah same. I I also uh, don't engage much because this is my platform and mm-hmm. Muddy River News is my platform. And if you want to come play in my sandbox, come play in my sandbox. I'm not going to go play in yours. Okay. Yeah. So, to that, I saw a public forum where people were discussing an issue and it was um what was the issue an issue issue. i think we all know no actually it wasn't even that it was separate yeah it was totally separate it was um comparing the enterprise zone comparison like comparison Mm -hmm. to the like getting united alloy Uh to the tiff three that was see the tiff wasn't the issue so no it was not apples to apples right well, the whole argument was 100 new jobs are coming to Quincy was made by a post. And mm-hmm. um, then it was said that, you know, all these TIFF arguments. I'm like, wait, how is this even comparable? Like, why are we comparing this? I know I shouldn't jump in because I was not one of the people tagged. You were tagged. David Adam was tagged. I was not tagged, but I still came in and asked. There's a reason for that. A question. I tagged, yeah. looked, I rolled, moved on. And Mike, but when you're calling people out or saying this, this, and this, and saying the no caucus. Mm-hmm. That's the new, um, like, local virtue signaling around here. Were David and I being considered no caucus because we were tagged? I think you were tagged because they're like, hey, listen to these points. I, I've heard the points before. Okay. But, so the no caucus, like, thing is this new local way of virtue signaling. That's not new. It, it, it's been around since Bud Kneecamp. The, the Nehru of no. Bud Kneecamp got rid But no, no, no. But was, was, was Bud Kneecamp, I guess, he was he canceled? Well, like he died. Because, Does that count? <laughs> That's no. the ultimate cancel there. Yeah. He was removed. He had to. He They R. took R. the lawsuit. To, the, the way uh, Bob Adrian made his uh, bones in order to get elected as a judge in the first place was because he represented Bud Kneecamp when uh, the school board tried to sue to get Bud Kneecamp removed because he served on the county board and the school board, and they felt that was a conflict of interest. Ooh, and eventually Bud rich. did have to leave. He chose to leave the school board okay. and then was on the county board for a few more years, then retired. Of course, his grandson is now our county clerk, and he's doing a, he's doing a really good job. And uh, he was, a matter of fact, I needed some information on him on this meeting i'm going to tonight and he gra- gladly provided it so so yes no the the no caucus uh, has been around for a while bud knee camp i mean it was like sky okay uh the are all in favor of the sun rising tomorrow it's a 6-1 vote bud knee camp voted no that was a standard running joke at a lot of like function service club people would say that but you know bud has these things like i won't spend money Questioning, but like, and that's not my mo really. But questioning something or not agreeing with something shouldn't just make curiosity me, caucus. I would call it. Yeah, right? I guess. But like, it's just crazy to me to think that like you 
can't question something without being told you're wrong or like, you're a problem. You you are the you're problem. the jack. What's or, your hey, idea? Hey, what's your idea? And okay, so this to that. This is my biggest thing. I don't need an idea. So, like if Mela came to me and asked, hey, mom, I need $500 for a bike. And I'm like, no. Well, then she says to me, well, then what are you going to use that $500 for? Well, A, I don't have to have a plan for what I'm going to use that $5 yeah. for. And B, to take it back to what we're arguing about, um, tiffs, whatever. Why can't the plan just be city expenditure um savings general. general general fund money why do i need a plan to save for a rate like i don't know well, i and i look at tiffs kind of like sorry to cut you off no, but you know when you google tiffs like one of the first negative things is corruption mm -hmm. right uh confusion i know that maybe there have been a certain few good things that have been a byproduct of it but i don't know why they came about and my general distrust in uh, government entities tells me that someone's benefiting from it and it's not necessarily the little people, right? Yeah. Because generally when you come up with something like that, uh, that, that brings in government funds or that controls general funds or that d does things that diverts money from uh, the general good to something private is a little iffy and confusing to say the least. Uh, so I don't think it's a bad thing that we're questioning it. It's iffy and confusing too because the players in this game for me like that are like supporters of this mm -hmm. are so-called conservatives or I don't know self-styled libertarians that are the ones that are saying hey like if you don't support this you're a nay you're you're a naysayer yeah. you're a no caucus you're a this 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 and this I'm like why like I don't know you're not going to Brow, what is it called? Browbeat. Browbeat, Browbeat me. You. You're not going to insult me. You're not going to like make me bend the knee to support you. Like that's not the way about going about things. The other thing is to say like in regards to David's story where city council and um, Brett Austin went up to council and, and basically said, you know, this is kind of a bias. Yeah. Well, you know what? It probably is because bias happen from reputation. Yeah. And you create your own reputation. Yeah. So like in the umbrella of TIFF, if you support one but not the other and this and that, like maybe it's about the people that are behind it. Well, the people that are behind it, also the venture. So so when you're talking about like uh, Ryan G. Tanner, right? Mm -hmm. We'll throw it out there. Uh, it's a different venture. I'm just going to say that. Yeah. Right? It's a different dollar amount. It's a different... Um, also, community TIF project. Two is already there. Like yeah. that's where they're drawing from. TIF two is already there. So yeah. to compare TIF two, like to, I mean, it, it already exists. Well, and also Chuck Bevelheimer said they would have they would they would look they would consider moving money from TIF two to TIF three in order to kickstart it. I mean, that was one. So of the So that might take said. away from that hotel or how? No, that money's already earmarked. We're talking okay. about just any other TIF. I mean, because new TIF revenues generate obviously every year. So, so maybe gotcha. can you answer this for me? So one of my. Uh, I don't know if it's a good idea. It was just an idea. When you have a TIF district that is uh, being formed, a new TIF district, can there be stipulations put on it? Like until this reaches a certain dollar amount sure. or until we get a certain year, this money can only be used or siphoned from TIF 2 to do um, well, general fund project like streets. The city, or the city council has the ultimate say on where the money goes. Okay. So and obviously they've used it for infrastructure in the past. They mm -hmm. used it for the townhouses around State and Eighth. They used it for infrastructure around the Croc Center. Mm -hmm. So it's been it'll be used for it can be used for city infrastructure. Because I think yes. the biggest problem is people are uh, questioning private development with these funds, right? So when but you're they're, private, but they're meant to spur private development. That's what a TIF is supposed to do. Well, but if you have Okay. I mean, that's, that's the purpose of it. I mean, it, there, there are two, I believe there's 283 different TIF, TIF districts in Chicago. Now, we all know, though not, there's a few of those that might be on the shady side. Um, yeah. And that reputation, and I've, okay. least, so I've read and done, I've done a lot of research on those in the past. And yeah, there's some that are just like, I mean, those are sweetheart deals. I think the biggest problem with this one is that the fact that it sort of came up, yes, they had discussions on it, whatever, but when the Joint Review Board met, and passed this five to one uh, with the Park District being the only board that dissented because they actually took a vote 
and none of these other taxing bodies took votes. They just sort of told the representatives, go vote for it. Yeah. Which is perfectly legal and fine. Or it's not, I don't think it's fine. Doesn't I think make it's legal. It right. I think it's legal. Doesn't make it, it is right. legal. It's a more state yeah. law. Who decides but in the, the past, representatives? We don't know. Or? The count, the, the bodies, the, the bodies will tell, hey, so like the school select board one. select Ryan uh, Wicker to go. Uh, the county took uh, so the did assessor the city take a vote and say Ben Uzlak is our representative? Uh, he was appointed by the mayor. Okay. So, yes. So that is how that works. But That's again, works. those bodies did not take the actual votes to say we support this gotcha. and in the past i believe they all did when tiff 2 was formed i'm i'm pretty sure that all the bodies went ahead and took the votes and did that so doing it this way while legal does throw shade on it in my opinion yeah i think if and and that's the reason that when well probably before we're done here as you guys will be our guest, I have to schlep over to the courthouse and listen to the county board Emergency yell about this. So, so I think that you just brought up a good point. Right and legal are two different things. Mm -hmm. And going back to your reputation, it's kind of like there's a reason that people question it. It may be because of reputation. It may be because in our minds it's not necessarily right. It may be because when you go to a city council meeting, only the people who support it are there. So my suggestion, okay, public debate let's do like something that brings in someone who's very knowledgeable on the opposite end someone who's very knowledgeable on the pro end right and have them debate and everybody should be able to come and listen to both sides because right now I feel like it's not very fair and even when you're talking about these things there's a lot of people who don't understand it there's a lot of people who want to understand it but there's a lot of people who get to push things through who understand it a little too well. Well, and again, you had all these people show up uh, at Monday night's uh, council meeting to talk about it, and some of the people who talked, who spoke against it, um, and the public, the public hearing they had where it was like you guys attended and it was 18-0 in favor. Yes, that was, the deck was stacked there, and uh, the, because yes, they had the meeting, but they also, as you've rightly pointed out numerous times. While the city will promote yard waste and all these other things 72 times on their Facebook page, they did not at all or barely the public hearing. It was not hearing. posted on their We Facebook. posted it uh, on yeah. ours. Mm -hmm. But uh, so, yeah, they, they, that process was not, uh, again, as, as open as it could have been. Now, um, I believe this county board discussion tonight, uh, we're going to find out, you know, who, who decided for the county who decided that the count for the county was going to vote that way? And and Ken Snyder's been pretty open that said he he had said he had told Georgine Zimmerman to do that as the county board chair, just like the mayor, just like the mayor appointed Ben Uzelak, he appointed Georgine Zimmerman, and Georgine Zimmerman went and supported it, and Ben Uzelak supported it because Ben, in his opinion, and Ben is a supporter, um, and perhaps he felt that he had a. Um, the consensus i guess we'll find out whenever this thing gets voted on by the city if he had a consensus um regardless <clears throat> ashley made a great point earlier mm -hmm. about how the fact that no matter the outcome uh this has brought people to local government this has brought attention to engagement. local government yeah. engagement people are interested they're paying attention uh i hate that it's a you know, you have to be white or black. You can't ask questions. You can't be on the fence. It's like you either come here and support us or you're against us. I don't like that, but I do very much appreciate that people are getting involved. People are getting engaged. Regardless of the reason, I think it's important for people to be active in things that affect your community. And this is definitely one of them. So uh, kudos to everybody who's working for and uh, questioning it. I think it is important and We'll see, we'll see what shakes out, but I think it is really, it's been interesting to watch it all play out for sure. Did you wear white because I wore black? I didn't, but. Did you, it's not Labor Day, or it's not Memorial Day yet either. Listen, I don't play by the rules. And you rules. wearing white? I don't play by the rules, man. I wore my serpent shirt I wore because... white when I got married too, just for the record. <laughs> yeah, I don't play did by the, the, the did rules. Did a lightning bolt strike the church? Nope, we didn't okay. get married we in, in church. church? For that oh, marriage. smart. I had already had a baby. I don't play by the oh, rules, dude. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. That's, that's Well, hey, so, that's okay. I wore my snake yeah. shirt even though I'm not a snake or no. uh, I'm not cunning. I'm, it, I'm is not it, um, impudent. Yeah. 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 Uh, saucy was the other word, right? Yeah, and um, I think um, do snakes eat minks? 
Is it live I'm free? Or, is that your live free or die yeah. shirt? Your Gadsden flag shirt? No, it's a cobra. Not yeah. a so. But isn't the snake like the it wrapped around something is like a symbol of? Uh, no, well, I'm there totally was that snake in the Garden of Eden. I was that waiting the for apple. him to but that. that <laughs> and it's also like <laughs> something with like a constitution or like something political. Somebody's gonna have Get to the write Gadsden in. flag. Yeah. The, yeah. the yellow flag with a snake that represents the 13 colonies. Yeah. Live, live free or die. There you That's go. That's the Gazan flag. Has, it's, the um, it's, the, it's the symbol of the Tea Party. There yes. you go. The snake can have a bad reputation, you know, with religion in regards to that. But, like, again, reputation precedes you, but it can be changed, you know. And that kind of is a, a big yeah. thing with our, our next guest, you know. Absolutely. I am so excited to hear this fellow talk. It is. It's a. It's a. It's a really. It's, it's It's a great testimony to to just change. Yeah, making yeah. you know they, we can all have really bad. We can all make a mistake. We all do make mistakes. We can all it's have bad days. It's human. And sometimes you might think that decision or that uh, choice completely ruined I your life. I do it every day. Uh, <laughs> but then it's but about how you change from that. Or yes. That yeah. determines. Yes. Your the reputation. Best, the best apology. Change behavior. Yeah. Right? So you can have a reputation and you can hate that reputation, but if you apologize and then change your behavior. Actually change it? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. So, uh, yeah, our next guest is totally badass. I can't wait to talk to him. All right. It's going to be so fun. All right. We'll do that right after this. The Liquor Booth is your home for a huge selection of beer, wine, and spirits. The Liquor Booth has two locations in Quincy, 3520 Broadway and 1500 North 12th Street. The Liquor Booth, where it's always happy hour. AMB Properties is Quincy's largest apartment rental company with hundreds of units available. They offer short-term and long-term rentals with one up to four bedroom apartments. AMB Properties meets the needs of its tenants with care, compassion, and a quality of service that exceeds expectations. AMB Properties also has a convenient tenant app for you to do your payments or make repair requests. Give them a call today. AMB Properties, 217-919-8080, Quincy. Mr. Shane McDermott, yes, well, welcome. It. So Brittany called me yesterday to kind of give me the skinny, as she does all the time because she's amazing at what she does here at Muddy River News, which is, uh, it, for anyone who doesn't know, she grabs the guests and uh, kind of gives me the rundown before we come on, and I just kind of fly in and, and get the opportunity to sit down and learn more. You're just better at speaking, though. Like, I can call her, and I'm like, da 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 and she understands Brittany speak, and then yeah. she can make the magic happen. So it was last-minute speak is what you're saying? Uh, Not very last-minute. This has, been, this has been in the works for a while, but we wanted to make sure that we did you justice because not only do you have this fucking phenomenal story, uh, but you're going through some shit now. So we want to do right by you uh, and your family. But I think let's start, unless you have another. Uh, I think we should start of, with the yeah, story the of Shane. Then. All right. The story of Shane. So let's start. Where were you raised? In Colorado. Okay. Whereabouts? Denver. Oh, cool. Okay. So. When I look at you today, I see this like stand up dude. I know you through other various parts of uh, grown up life, yeah. grown up life. But after I talked to her, I was like, holy shit, this guy has a very colored past. Well, and that's been part of my life here. I've, I've moved here in 2001 for a job. And um, when I came up here, that was part of my life. Nobody knew anything about my past. It was all about who I was at that point. You know, I was the head of my GIS career, and I moved up here for an engineering company, and nobody had a damn clue about me. Is that right. part of the reason why you moved? No, here? no, it wasn't. I had been beyond that. I, you know, I just had moved already up moved here on because of it was a career change, and it was a cool yeah. spot to move up to. And but that part of my life, the past of my life nobody knew about yeah for a long time and I mean a long long time yeah so let's start with because I saw something on Facebook not too long ago that kind of uh tiptoed into the waters of mm -hmm. your past I'll say and how what you're doing to kind of help people uh who've been in the same situation but let's just get right to it so while you were in Colorado you got into a little bit of trouble yeah so when I was a kid my parents got divorced and I was seven years old they fought over us so it was a very unique situation because my two older brothers had a different father, but my dad adopted them. Their father abandoned them. 
So my dad adopted them, and then my mom and dad had me and my sister. Well, it lasted for seven or eight years when they got divorced. My older brothers automatically went my bro- with my mom, and the judge decided it was a great idea to stick my sister with my mom and me with my dad, so they ripped my whole family apart. <laughs> and from that point on, it was a disaster. Yeah. So probably through about, I don't know, seven or eight when that happened, probably about the time I was 11 or 12, I was running away all the time. My mom would talk me into running away from my dad, and I'd do that. I'd run to my dad. My dad would talk me into running away from my mom. I'd do that, run to my dad. Well, then I ran out of places, and I'd run to my aunt's house. And then eventually, by the time I was 15, 16 years old, <clears throat> I just ran out of places to run. Yeah. So then I went on my own. So by the time I was 15 or 16 years old, I was homeless, living on the streets, dumpster diving, you know, going to a restaurant, eat dinner, run, until finally – It caught up to me. When I was 16 years old, it caught up to me in a bad, bad way. So let me go ahead and say, wow, I'm surprised. I know, I'm crying crying that too. So this is, hearing it from you is one thing. Hearing it from you. In Brittany talk. Who've experienced, who's experienced it is is totally different. So uh, when you, I apologize for, I mean, not my place, but. I'm sorry that that happened to you. Yes, I'm sorry that that had to happen. But as you said so eloquently before we started, uh, you're not sorry, right? Because it's gotten you where you are. But every day you change in your life changes where you're at right now. Yeah. You know, and and those days were hard. They were difficult, but they built me to the person I am. I mean, and that wasn't even a bad spot. Yeah. We'll talk about bad spots. That was that was a rough spot. Okay, so at 16, what happened? Um, 15, 16. So eventually, you know, I had run away from group homes. They put me in group homes. They eventually, um, I stole a car. They put me into juvenile detention. I escaped, which was part of my problem. I just ran. I ran from everything. Yeah. So I escaped from juvenile detention. Then they sent me up to a, basically a juvenile prison camp. Well, that lasted like three days, and I escaped again. Well, Are you time, some kind of Bugs Bunny or some shit? No, or like, like Tasmanian Devil? I was like, like golly. Right. All so, right. I'm not going to ask you how you did it. Because, camp yes so, so at that, that point that was when Colorado I was just done with it so I had met this girl when we were in juvenile detention and we stayed in touch which was a bad idea on their part to let us stay in touch but we did so I ran away from this juvenile prison camp basically with a friend of mine and we got away and then I called where she was at which was a group home and I went and picked her up and we stole a car and we ran off to Vegas we Is this were trying the to second to- car that you stole yeah, I mean, second, third, I don't know. It was a, there was a somewhere few in there. of them at that point. Yeah, somewhere in there. So, you know, at this point, I, I think I was 15 at this point. So we stole a car. Well, let me back up a couple of days. So we were staying in a friend of mine's basement, and his parents were like, they knew what we were mm-hmm. had been up to, and they were like, they let us stay there for a while, and they are like, you guys got to go. So before we left, of course, my friend gives me a gun, which was a bad idea. Again, how old? Were you? We, I was 15, and she was probably about 15, okay. too. We were about the same age. So okay. we stole a car, and we went off to, we were trying to go to California for whatever reason, because nobody wants to go to California now, but we wanted to back then. Back yes. then, though, it was Maybe the, it was the La La Land. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think the Beach Boys were still yeah. out there. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was enticing. So we get arrested in Nevada. And you and the girlfriend? Yeah. Okay. With the gun? Yes. Okay. And so at that point, I had admitted that I had a gun on me. Even though I never flashed it, I never showed it. It was in a it was in a duffel bag, and we basically a guy was loading his groceries up in his car, and we jumped in his car and tore ass out of there. Jesus. Got some good groceries though. Was, that was all right. It seemed like a good idea. <laughs> but my admission to having a gun, so mm-hmm. I was the first person in the state of Colorado to get charged with carjacking as as a 15 year old child, without actually carjacking because yeah. you had a weapon. But uh, it was just making a point, you know. That was there was a You're problem a, out there yeah. with that going on and I was the first one to You were set an example of. But the problem was, so I got to Nevada, and we got in trouble out there. So Nevada put me on probation because we got out there and of course we were doing the same thing out there. And Colorado wouldn't come get me and extradite me. Had they done that, I would have went back to Colorado and I would have probably spent 2 years in a juvenile detention facility and then I went home to my family. Right. Problem was I had no family. My family was yeah, a disaster by yeah. then. So I went back to, to Texas, and they knew eventually I would come back home to see my family. And they just waited. You know, I would get arrested in Texas for speeding. Spent a night in jail. They let me go because Colorado wouldn't spend the money to come get me. Eventually, I came home to see my mom and got caught. And I got sentenced to eight years in prison for carjacking. Jesus. Armed robbery, basically, is what it was. Now, how old were you then? I was 18 at the time. 
You got sentenced to eight years. How much time did you do? Well, well, it goes on. That's where oh, it gets real. Shit. Real. I knew real it. Confusing. I'm sweating. My palms are sweaty. Okay. So, I, so I got sentenced to eight years. They sent me to a medium security prison, which was not security a great enough. Time. Yeah. For so, idea. Yeah. So I was there for about a year, and of course I was a runner. So me and a buddy of mine, we jumped the vest and run. And Jeez. he didn't make it very far, and I made it for a couple of days before I got caught. I got another 10 years for that. So I had an 18-year prison sentence when I was I was about 19 at that point. But they knew they couldn't keep me, so they had to stick me in maximum security prison. Now, this Shawshank is, I was about eight, 1989, I think it was, and maximum security prison in Colorado was not a great place to be. That's not a good place. Okay, age this I think I was 19 at the time. Okay. Yeah, I'd only been in it for about a year. You're so a as baby. an 18, 19 yep. year old kid facing 18, 19, that's your whole life. Yep. So I never thought I would get out. You know, I just gave up on life, and I became a really nasty person in there. You know, I sold heroin for a living. That's how I made my money in there. I got really? in fights. I got stabbed. This is all news. I've not heard. I mean, I got Shane. What's your middle name? Christopher. Shane Christopher. I mean, it was an ugly, ugly time in my life. So I met two people in my life. People always ask me, what changed your life? Yeah, so what did? I'm so like, I was probably in for about five years, and I met two guys that were serving life sentences that would never, ever see the day of light again. They were going to be in there for the rest of their lives. Provided you couldn't make them escape or get them to escape. <laughs> yes. Now, we tried a few <laughs> They're times. They're like, but... Shane, give me some tips, man. <laughs> but let me explain these two guys. So one of them. They're, they're, one of them was a little older than I was, a couple years, and the other one was probably a few years older than him. And they just sat me down. They're like, what in the hell are you doing, you know? You're a young kid. you got a chance to get out. We don't. What, what is your problem? Why do you keep doing all this stupid shit? And because that's all I knew was stupid shit. I didn't yeah. understand how to fix my life. And at that point in time, they were both like, listen, you got to get your stuff together because you have a chance to get out and do something. So they told me, you're going to start going to these college classes. And we didn't have to pay for them. They had Pell Grants and all that. They're like, you're going to start going to college, and you're going to stay out of trouble. And this was about a year and a half, two-year time period where we were in the same prison where they were like, this is your life. You know, From deal here with on it. Out. Yeah. yeah. So I did. I started taking some college classes. And then eventually you get moved around a lot in prison because I obviously tried to escape a couple times, and I got caught. So <laughs> Obviously. So they separate us out a lot. And when you have a friend in prison, they get you away from them. As soon so, as they see you close, yeah, they, like, cohorts, separate you out. Like yeah, they don't want this. that shit. What yeah. about those two guys? Did you get separated from them? Yeah. So um, eventually I didn't see him again until I got out. So this was probably, oh, God, this was probably early 90s when I didn't see him anymore. But we'd still keep in touch. And So my one friend, his name was Smiley. Mm-hmm. Um he died in prison from hepatitis C, from getting tattoos or shooting heroin or whatever it was, but he died in prison. Uh, my friend Norman actually ended up getting out. So Colorado paroled him. He went back to Florida, and he ended up getting paroled, and now he's married and living a happy life like I Yay, am. Hey, Norman! Yeah. Yay. So this is one of the things I tell people all the time. Ten years in prison, I've met hundreds of hundreds of people, none of who I would call friends except for two people that mm-hmm. died. One died and one's out now. Out of all those people I met, only two people other than me are out and can make this. Yeah. That's the problem. You know, I got that you know of. Yeah. Like, but yeah, that is that. But what do you attribute that to? Um, not wanting to sit in a 10 by 10. Yeah. That's Personal it. Personal choice. Yeah. Right? I yeah. mean, you had encouragement, which thank goodness. Yeah. But from guys that don't see daylight, though, yeah. you know, they're like, what are you doing? Why Does would you Does that happen do regularly? No, I don't think yeah. so. So, not that I'm like, making excuses for people, but it's a good thing that you had these guys, right? It is, yeah. yeah. If I hadn't met them, well, not just if, if I hadn't met them, if I had I got out after my eight-year prison sentence, I would have yeah. went back. I would have just went back sure. and done the same shit because yeah. I didn't learn a lesson. You got to figure it out and learn what you're doing is wrong and that you can't do this. Role models, right? You yeah, had a couple role models. Yeah, two damn lifelong prisoners. Well, I think, <laughs> but hey, look, I think there's something to be said for that, that yeah. they were like, don't do what we're doing. So yeah. even though they may not have been the most upstanding uh, they looked at you and they were like, "We're gonna be this guy's mentors," and they and like did live it. vicariously yeah. through him right? too. Well, they like, probably yeah. would have beat my ass if I didn't listen to him well, too. So there you go. Too. Hey, good for them, but good for you as well. I mean, I know we all have people telling us things we should be doing. Yeah. Rarely do we listen. So good yep. for you for listening uh, and and acting on kind of 
I guess, yeah, their example mm-hmm. or lack thereof or whatever it was. But it, it took was. a while, you know. We figured 1992 or so I spent another five years in prison after that. Really? And, you know, I had troubles. I had problems. You know, I had fights. You know, I was a skinny white boy in a prison full oh, yeah. of nasty people. Drug so. use? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I got struck on heroin many times. Really? Did coke. You know, Holy shit. Smoked a lot of weed. In um, prison. I, I saw more drugs in, in prison. prison than I've ever saw out here. How is that? I, I mean, I, I, well, I. You know why? Two words, three words. Corrupt prison. I was guards. about to say yeah. corrupt. That's all. Yeah. Corrupt. That's all. Well, I mean, we all watch the shows. Watch, like, them get, yeah. watch them get arrested over and over again, and that's what it's all about. Those storylines don't just come from thin air. Yeah. No. You know. No, it's, um, it's reality. Yeah. Orange is the new black. Or, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Crazy. But okay, so you moved on after this. I don't want to like fast forward too much, but I know we have a slight amount yeah. of time for the Shane story because it's a huge right. story. You well, can always go come to back. 1997. But... So okay. I got out of prison in 1997. Colorado was really gracious. They gave me a hundred dollars when I got oh, out of prison. Did... I had to fight my family to figure out which one was going to take me because you have a pl- have a place to go, you know. And so I was in Colorado, and going to Texas was not an easy chore. They have to accept you. And it, not only the state, but your family, too. So mm-hmm. my brother and his wife let me come and live with them. Now, this was, you know, they haven't seen me in over 10 years. You know, I don't, in the 10 years I was locked up in prison, the only person ever visited me was my sister. I didn't see my brother in 10 years or wow. my mom. I hadn't talked to my dad in probably eight years. So my family life was a disaster. But my brother let me come home. And so I lived with him for about a month or so. I got a good job and went on my own. And after that, it was just like, you know, I got the crutch, I got the little help, and I'm not going back to that to yeah. that life. You Do know? you and so your brother still talk? He's gone now. Oh, I'm sorry. But I'll tell you what, him and his wife, I would not be where I'm at without those two. Yeah. And so him and I became very close. As soon as I got out, him and I were really, really good friends. Mm-hmm. Damn it, Shane. And, you know, that, that part of my life changed, you know, because, you know, if I was him, hell no, I wouldn't open that door. You don't think a, so? No way. Not knowing he was knowing me as I was in that time and not seeing me for 10 years, trust me to come into his life with two young boys there. His, he had kids that were seven, eight years old. Yeah. That was a, that was a long stretch of trust. That was yeah. a ballsy choice. Yeah. So he did. And, you know, I devote a lot of what I've done to, to three people. One's gone, one's Norman and the other's my brother. So can we shout out your brother? And... Absolutely. Okay. Brad McDermott. You know, rest in peace, brother. All right. Yes. Brad. Looking down on me right now. Probably yeah. drinking a beer. <laughs> cheers cheers cheers, yeah. cheers to yeah, him. he was a good dude uh cheers because i'll tell you like i said we have connections I'm trying not to cry but um i wouldn't have known you right and i think mm-hmm. you you have brought some amazing things um to this world like we were talking about mistakes happen uh so since um getting out you said you've kind of the crutch was necessary right but then you have built on that with your own I guess, understanding and appreciation of today's world, right? Mm-hmm. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I would think okay. so. All right. Yeah, I mean, you know, you have to think when you miss 10 years of society. You know, oh. you know it's not like you have <laughs> Facebook and stuff back yeah. then. There was none of that. You know, we were just reading papers and stuff. You get out and everything's different. You know, when you get out, it's not like you can have an understanding and, ex- you know, jump right back into things it does not happen like that yeah you can't be ashley at the party and going around, going around shaking hands talking, being like hey yeah. how you doing Bubba? well think about the things that you would miss in 10 years Absolutely. Oh, going even, in as an 18 year old young man and then coming out as 27 year old man Mm-mm. you haven't and seen those a are woman in 10 years, years. Anyway. yeah you haven't had mcdonald's in 10 years mm-hmm. you haven't had i mean you ate grub for 10 years and fought for your life you haven't gone to a bank no you haven't experienced like even communicating with someone like across a counter that you owe money, right? Mm-hmm. Like just every right. day. And again, the form. Shit. Pumping gas. Oh, yeah. I mean, just. Paying for gas. I'm, so it was a credit card. What I'm, the hell My is mind that? is blown. Yeah. I was talking to Jenny today because she asked me, what are you going to talk about? Real quick, Jenny is his wife. Yeah. For the viewer. Yeah. So she asked me today. She's like, she's what amazing. What are you going to talk about? Yes. And I said, well, there's one line from a movie, and it's The Rock. And he says something about. The excitement of my day is avoiding gang rape in the prison shower. <laughs> and then you come out here, and she was telling me today how, oh, how we've come from such a rough <laughs> life, and now we're doing so well. And I'm like, I don't want to hear about that shit. You know, this is what I had to deal with. You know, soap on a rope was a real deal. Yeah. And I'm like, the longer the better, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, but you think about that. Prison life is no joke. And then you jump out here, and it's like people complain about the most small and petty yeah. things. And I'm like, really? 
Are you kidding me? Get a clue. But you still have a good sense on your, I don't know, you still can joke, and oh, I like that to. about you. you. If you can't laugh about it, you damn well better not cry about it. Yeah, love that. So this all surprised me because I knew, like I said before on Facebook posts, you have not only, um, I don't even know what the word is, rehabilitated. Reformed or your life. Reformed or whatever, but now you've taken it back and you're helping others, right? Well, here was the biggest problem I had is when I finally got to a point where I got to see the pro board, they sit there and almost laugh at you because mm-hmm. you talk about how you're going to get out and do the right thing and be the right person and change your life. And they hear it all the time. And they, they say 70-some percent recidivism rate of people that get out of prison come back. I've yeah. seen people get out of prison and be back before the next chow line. Well, you active. said you would have. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, what's $100 going to buy? You know what most people do when they get $100 in Colorado? Drugs. They go out and buy mm-hmm. a gun because then oh. they go rob somebody, and then they got $300. Well, mm-hmm. what do you think oh, happens to them? They come back to prison. So reforming your life has absolutely nothing to do with the prison system. All they are is a damn hotel for people that break the law. They don't do shit to help you reform your life. Yeah. When you get out, 100% of everything that you do from that point on is on you. Whether you break the law and go back, that's your damn fault. If you go out and get a job and make a living and do good and make a life for yourself, that's your fault too. Nobody else gets the credit for this. That's it. So I've had, you know, as I've gotten out, I've had people that have wanted me to get involved in like prison reform and, and, um, you know, like the religious groups that go back in and they want me to come back in and talk about, you're a Catholic. You know, you go to church every Sunday. It, it had to have been because of him. A lot of my life is because of him. But mm-hmm. 100% of the reason that I reformed my life was because of me. Yeah, It's because I, I didn't want to be back there. And I knew I could do better. So something that has to change is that crutch. Every person that comes out of prison needs a crutch. Yeah. You don't come out of here on your own and just make it. It's and it very needs rare. To be more than $100. Yeah. And I don't know what they give now, but I mean, that's not going to buy you shit. So when I got out, once I got on my own and started working, you know, I just had to figure things out. Like, how do you not spend more than you make? That was hard because I mean, in prison, I was making 25 cents an hour. That don't go very far. You know, I got out and I was making $12 an hour. I was like, holy shit, I think I'm, I'm rich. rich. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm rich. It's like I hit the damn lottery. Yeah. But as I got on my feet and started learning to do things like, buy a car you know i so i got out in 97 and 99 i bought my first house i also had my first marriage which lasted nine months so i hadn't seen a woman in nine years <laughs> You're ma- like marry me only, baby yeah marry. let's do this I get it. Uh, yeah it was yeah, great I lasted get it. nine months <laughs> yeah but we both went our separate ways it was great she bought my house she, she wanted to stay there and i moved on to do other things and and so in 2001, I moved up here. I'd only been out of prison for four years when I met Jenny. Well, five years, because I met her five years after I'd been out. And she was one of the first people that I told about my past. I didn't tell anybody. My boss, Pat Pepping. I'm sorry, Pat. But <laughs> you, know I, you know I lied to you. <laughs> but, I, but I learned early on that when you get out, you don't tell people, yeah, I, I just came out of prison. You know, I'd be, I'd be a, a great employee, you know. Yeah. Really early on, I learned not to do that. Because so, reputation, yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah. So we'll I create a bias. So when I came up here, I I came up here. I you know I lived in Texas <clears throat> for most of the time I was out, and I just wanted to live in Texas the rest of my life. So I came <laughs> up here because I needed a, a job. The company I was working for was going out of business, so it was just a means to an end. I was going to come up here and get my ass back to Texas. So and then you met. Yeah. Jay. So a year after I moved up here, uh, I was in San Diego at a convention. <laughs> And I met Jenny. I was actually meeting with the company that I was going, that was hiring me, moved me back to Texas. And so we were negotiating moving expenses and stuff. And sure enough, I came back here and I told her what was going on. I already had a job. I rented a condo. I had it furnished. I was moving my ass back to Texas. My mom was happy because she did large. not. Yeah. yeah. Well, then I decided not to do it. My mom was so pissed because I wasn't coming home. But, but where had your mom been this whole time? Was she still um, in the she, picture? Yeah, yeah, all my, t- all my okay. family at that point, we were all back, back together. good. And, good. Know, but good. Uh, she wanted me back home. Yeah, naturally. Yeah. Well, I didn't go back home. 
Good so for us here because for, Quincy what, 23 sucked years later, you in. 23 years later, I think I got a shackle on here. This we are the black hole. Uh, yeah. yeah, listen, it just you is can't what ex- it is. You can't escape you can't it. Can't explain it, but you can't escape it either. No. So, but you've been a force for the community too. Like what she was saying, giving back. Um, talk a little bit about your foundation. Yeah, so it took me a while. So when I moved up here, I was still a convicted felon. You know, I How still old? had. Um, I was. Oh man, I was. 2001, so I was 32 years old okay. when I moved up here. Right. So for six years, I worked for an engineering company here in town, PSBA, you know, one of the greatest engineering companies yeah. in the entire town. <laughs> sure Shameless there's a few plug. people that don't like to hear That's that. That's all right. <laughs> Whatever. Shameless But plug. at some point, I decided I need to do my own thing. So I worked for myself for a while, and it, I was at a convention in Las Vegas, and I met an attorney, and, he, and I told him my story, you know, about how I had gotten out and own my own business now. And he was like, man, why don't you hook up with me and we could figure out a way to get you a pardon. And I was like, ah, whatever. You know, he's like, I could clear your record. You have a great story. Well, yeah. So I started talking yeah. to this guy and I had felonies in two states, Nevada and Colorado. So I'm like, all right, well, let's try it. So he got me started on this path and it was about six years ago. I had to go out to Colorado or out to Nevada. And I, unfortunately I had to um, mislead my children because they knew nothing about my past at this time. They had no clue. They were pretty little still. So we went out to Carson City and we stayed up in Lake Tahoe for a vacation over Easter. Mm-hmm. And I had to go down to Carson City and I met with the, the um, Supreme Court of Nevada and the governor of Nevada. And they gave me a full and conditional pardon. Um, they listened to my story. I had to talk about... All right, take a break. So uh, I just want to say when he says misleading his children... There's a certain age at which I think you I don't think that's are, misleading. No, I think it, there's a certain age when, you, when you're truthful with your kids. And I think that uh, spans uh, of, of varying degrees mm-hmm. of truth. And when they're that young, I you think it would be that. irresponsible to expose right, that. To, to, yeah, because I don't think they could comprehend what, right. what their dad was. Right. So, okay, I was just kind of giving you a break. Yeah. I, so here's uh, the toughest sure. question mm-hmm. I had, had to answer. Mm-hmm is they were bombarding me with questions because, you know, my conviction in Nevada, I'm not ashamed to tell you, was armed robbery. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that was my M.O., you know. Once I learned how to use a gun, then I learned how to use a gun. So, sure. Um, so they asked me, you know, what's changed about you? How do you think you, you deserve this? You know, there was, the state's attorney in Nevada was really tough on me, which was cool. I was completely okay with it. But rough. And I told him, I said, listen, my life right now is really good. I own my own business. I own my own house. I do good. I travel all over the world. What you're doing for me, if you give me this pardon, would be nice. It it would be great to have this. But the problem is, there's not a single question you can ever ask me in this room that will be tougher than my kids. Yeah. Telling your kids. Because someday they're going to say, Dad. Why'd you do that? Yeah. You know, what is this about your past? You know, because they're going to find out. They're not stupid. The internet. yeah, and, and he, he just sat back, that state's attorney, after he being, I mean, he was a dick. He was he did not want to give me a pardon. And he's he a sat product back. of his environment, so. Yeah, and, you know, of course, he's prosecuting people like yeah. me. I probably would have stood yeah. in front of him. T- you know, but at this time, this was in 1986, so mm-hmm. this is 30-some years later. The victim of my crime actually testified to give me a pardon. Wow. He met with me. He talked to me. Wow. The, the prosecuting attorney who was retired and almost dead at that point, promoted for my pardon because they don't see stuff like that very often. So, you know, I got my pardon. But the problem was I got it in Nevada, but I still had one in Colorado. And Colorado does not give out pardons. And I'll be honest, I was very lucky with Colorado. Um, Governor Hickenlooper wanted to run for president. He was on his way out. I put in my paperwork. Colorado does not give pardons to felons, especially in violent crimes involving firearms. And he wanted to make a statement on his way out the door. And I was one of about a hundred people that received a pardon. Holy shit! And when he did, that day changed my life. But in a way that doesn't even matter because my life was already changed for years before that. I was already going out trying, you know, I was doing things like, you know, being a scout leader and helping my son out with things and doing the things in the community that I was allowed to do without having a background check because I still had felony on my record. Just well, kind of absolved a little bit of yeah. That. You so were it got being rid the of parent. all that. I couldn't teach. Yeah, I was, which is a passion that, of yours. Oh yeah, I love substitute teaching. So my kids were at St. Francis at the time, and the pastor knew, 
Mm-hmm. The principal knew. We talk about this all the time. They know about my past, you know. I couldn't go in and do playground duty because I have a, I'm a convicted felon. This is when my kids were little. Well, when this happened, then I could. Mm-hmm. What do you think happened? Immediately the school invited me in to be a substitute teacher. It, and it took a while. Eventually my pardon shows up on, you know, the FBI network and the Illinois State Police, and then I can – Purchase firearms. I'm a concealed carry holder now. Yeah. You know, I do a lot of things now that I that are nice, but those yeah. didn't change my life. Yeah. The things that changed my life was being able to. I'm a scout leader now. Um, I'm on the the uh, scout board here in in our region here. I'm a board member now. I can teach now. Um, it doesn't hold me back from doing things in my kids' life that that really. Drove me crazy. Mm-hmm. One time they asked me if you want to be a, when I was, my son was in Cub Scouts, you want to be the, the den leader? I was like, hell yeah, I would love to do that. That'd be such uh-huh. a cool thing. Yeah. They handed me the paperwork. I was like, well, shit, background check, can't do that. And got to lie my way out of it and say, well, I, I'm busy. I can't do that, you know? Yeah. Uh, no, I want to do that. Mm-hmm. So once I was able to do that, that's what it changed a lot. But I was still very secretive with my past until one day we had moved to Missouri and I was like, this is bullshit. You know, you can't go through all this and just drift off into the sunset and not try to do something to make a difference in other people's lives. So I started a foundation called Kids Second Chance, which has been very difficult to do because we did it right during COVID and nobody would let us in to do anything. Mm -hmm. But I've been able to, I went to Q&D and did a talk on students and destructive decision making. And I'm like, what a perfect spot for me. Yeah, It was Outside of today, probably the best day of my life. I got to sit in front of 400 kids, all the faculty, and talk about my life and how you go from, you know, maximum security prison to talking to these kids about making a difference, Mm -hmm. changing your life, how you can make a mistake and it doesn't have to define you for the rest of your life. And Mark McDowell said to you that that day, in all the days that he had been there, was an out of all the assemblies that he had ever seen, you captivated the room. The yeah, students, he said that was the quietest they've the ever been. The students were yeah. just like, yeah. what? Like, and I mean, that tough. story was just like, Oh, what? I can imagine. I'm having a struggle here so just here's even listening something to the basis of, of it. About but. that day. So my, my son, at this point, my kids knew. But only not for very long. They knew some about my. Let's past, not disclose their names, but what are their ages? <laughs> so my son's a junior, and my daughter is in eighth grade now. Okay. So Christopher, oh sorry, Christopher. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tried. So <laughs> he he was a freshman this year, mm-hmm. and so we, you know, I get up and talk, and I had talked to him. I said, if you don't want me to do this, I won't. But if if you're okay with it, then. So he was I there during that. that sp- yeah, that's but Christopher's nice, yeah. a freshman at this time, and he's just like, you know, he don't know everybody in school mm-hmm. and all this stuff. And well, now everybody knows him. <laughs> yeah, and him and his buddies are sitting in the front row. And But he knew know, before? Oh, yeah, he that, knew okay, already. Okay, okay. But like my nephew was in there. He didn't had no idea. Okay. I ran oh. into him on my way out, and he's like, Uncle Shane, what the Holy hell? Yes. I didn't know anything about this. Yeah. I'm like, you might want to go talk to your dad. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I go through this whole thing with the assembly, and we, you know, I basically talked for like 50 minutes, and Mr. McDowell was like, if you run long, you'll know because I'm going to start walking towards you. And he never did. And he finally, when I was done, he came over and then he looked over in the crowd and he said, Chris, you okay? Yeah. And my son went, because <laughs> he knew. Yeah. This is very impactful yeah, for imagine being personal. a ninth grader yeah. and all of a sudden every one of your classmates know that, yeah. you know, that was your dad That's up there your talking. That's your experience, yeah. And a funny story behind this, about an hour before it starts, one of his buddies, because he has a really close group of friends. They all came from St. Francis, and they've been friends for, you know, 10 years or whatever it is. So we have an, this is the conversation. Ah, we have an assembly coming up, and, you know, they're all sitting around, and one of them says, uh, yeah, that's great. we got to listen to some felon talk to us. Oh, no. Christopher doesn't say nothing. <laughs> one of his other buddies who knows me very well because our family are really good friends, he goes, hey, that's Christopher's dad. <laughs> and the guy was just like, <laughs> oh, you don't come what, back from what, that. Yeah, what, no, what do they say? don't come back from You're that. Like, oh, smack then you just, in the face. Then you just walk up and dap that guy and be like, "Sorry, <laughs> yeah. bro." Yeah, yeah, that's Christopher's yeah. dad. Yeah. Oh well, shit. Sorry about. So, uh, the fact that you're using your experience. Okay, so the fact that you went through it is, of course, mind blowing. The fact that you found a way to to make a positive impact is another 
mind meld to me because I think most people just settle in, right? Mm -hmm. You just kind of settle into your environment and what you've, the cards you've been dealt and you don't try to do anything. I'm just skipping off uh, camera for one second. I'm yeah, no, you're good. So, no, I'm sorry. I was crying, but yeah. I think that I'm what you've crying. been doing, Hey, All listen, right, no that's part of it. I think is we're, I mean, we're not here to be, uh, we're not like trying to change the world, but I think any chance we get to spread a message that's positive and uh, change evoking, I think is really important. And I mm -hmm. think what you've done is even more so because you've been there. And it's easy for me to sit back and say something like, oh, I don't, I don't know why they can't just, for you to go through what you've been through, change worlds, and then full circle, now you have kids that you're trying to... Um, I guess keep out of that world is that mm -hmm. like for a lack of better here's an anomaly that i talk about all the time my son and i are very alike yeah almost everything about us when he was five or six same way as i was when he went through seventh eighth grade all that when he started his freshman year so when, when I was a freshman, I was a straight-A student just like he is, yeah. honor roll student. I mean, I did all the right things. Even in your upbringing, yeah, your hard so I, upbringing. So sitting here watching my son go through those You're like, same things, I'm like, man, whoa, whoa, whoa. don't slip. Yeah. And so, you know, when this stuff that we talk about here shortly happened, I was like, look, you have got to understand the slippery slope happens fast. Yeah. You cannot make – one, One mistake. Because if you do, it'll be held against you the rest of your life. Yeah. So I watch him like a hawk. Yeah. And he got past that point, and I don't worry about him now. It was just like, you know, is it part of your blood? Oh, you think and it like was, you're it passing was, it down maybe? Yeah, and it was oh. like, it was just my environment is what caused what I did. I mean, I did everything I did, and I take accountability for every bit of that. But your environment has so much to do with it. And... So the environment I provide for him is stability, someone to talk to, yeah. someone to hang out with. You know, if you got an Confide issue with something, him. talk to me. I want to be the first Very person important. you talk to. I don't give a shit what you did. I'm going to be there. We can fix it. Yeah. Yeah. But I slipped up. Oh, it's all right. Hang it's on. okay. I mean, so, go ahead. So we're talking about uh, Christopher's son. He also has another child. Uh, I'll let you re redirect me however you want. Yeah. But let me go ahead and, and say this. And for anyone who has kids or even those who don't, raising kids is very hard. So it's, it's a great reward. But, but with it... Biggest challenge. Challenges, tribulations, things that you never even thought you could even face, right? So I'm not giving your parents a pass, uh, but maybe now that you're an adult with kids, you're probably like, well, how do I, how do I navigate? Mm -hmm. Navigate that and maybe help them uh, avoid going through what I went through, right? right? Okay. And we navigate stuff now that my mm -hmm. parents never did. They didn't sure. Have all oh. This garbage social media and stuff that we take for granted right you know but what i was trying to think about was you know focusing so much on my son because he's like me so mm -hmm. much is i forgot about my daughter mm -hmm. you didn't forget about you her didn't, because yeah but i know you're like don't beat yourself yeah. off please but, you but were trying to she's just not like me and she didn't remind me of those those yeah Bad habits. Because mm -hmm. my son, he picked up all the good habits, but, you know, he got a lot of good habits from mother, and they ditched all the rest of them, thank <laughs> God. So it, it, I just didn't think so much about that. But I knew she's a very beautiful young lady, and I knew eventually you're going to have to deal with the dirtbags out there that are mm -hmm. going to come after him. Yep. Because it's going to happen. I don't give a damn how old your kids are, daughters. Yep. You're going to deal with this at some point. Yep. And I did. I just thought it came a little early at me, but I was And some boys, let's be fair. Yeah, and it some does. women are, or some gals are, a uh, dirtbag mm -hmm. either by yeah, not nature ways. or peer pressure, mm -hmm. but it does go both ways. I yeah. just want to say that. Okay. And, it, and it absolutely does. Okay. But I, I just think I slipped up a little bit and I wasn't quite prepared to protect her as early as I should have been. Yeah. Maybe taking was, for granted that she was 
uh, very independent, and the fact that you were tunnel vision with him, <laughs> right? And, and it is. So and it, it, it's a lot of that. Yeah. It's a lot of that. Yeah. And I get so, that, too. so, you know, I don't know, last fall, you know, she called me up and talked to me and told me that there was a college kid that was sending her inappropriate stuff. And... You know, it didn't, it didn't surprise me at all. You know, I was just like, all right, well, how inappropriate. And she told me, and it wasn't like I went on a rager or anything. I was expecting this. You know what's going to happen because yeah. that is just the way society is now. You're going to have these older kids that get out of high school and go on to college. And even like we talked about the older guys, way older guys, they're going to prey on young girls. Why and do you I, think she came to you? Because she trusts me. Bingo. And I'm, I'm her protector. Bingo. Mm-hmm. And so she did, and I was like, all right, well, let's deal with this. So she was at a friend's house, and her mom sent me the messages, and I looked at him, and I was like, all right, well, it's obviously against the law. I know what the law is, so I yeah. just turned it over to the sheriff's department. And I'll be honest with you, the Adams County Sheriff's Department, they were freaking badass yeah, how they phenomenal. dealt with this. Mm-hmm. Detective Shoney, I will give him a shout-out every single day of my life. That guy came in and took over and dealt with this. Gave you a parent's peace. Absolutely. He took over. Professionally and, and, he and promptly. He gathered all the yeah. evidence. He got search warrants for Instagram and Snapchat. He got everything that was needed for the state's attorney's office to press charges. And Can we preface this story just a little bit for the viewer if they're not involved in the news? Like, I don't really want to say, like, we don't have to go into all the detail, but you just mentioned Snapchat. So, like, yeah. let's, like, say, to, like, I guess the apps or the parties involved in this, because that's a big proponent or oh, yeah, part of the story. Everything happened over Snapchat and the, you know, from the user end, Snapchat is great because I can send you a picture of whatever I want. And after you click on it, I can decide if I want it to go away. But the problem is it don't go away. It doesn't go away. It's on a server sitting up in liberal heaven up there because we had to fight with them forever to get, the information that we wanted, even with search warrants, they just don't like to give you what you. Well, need. that's a huge. That's the basis of their platform. Exactly, is it's secrecy. safe. It can go away. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it's not so secret. You know, we. It so still we, exists. It's like who's going to yeah, use this? It but when go it is when coming to like minors, it's mm-hmm. surprising to me that you wouldn't work with your law enforcement it's, it's almost like they're working against it just and they do for that the for mere a reason, fact because of if reputation. they do that reputation their premise of the secrecy goes away because if they just put out there hey if you send pictures of your penis to a 13 year old girl and you're an adult they're gonna stay until they get a search warrant and then you're gonna go to jail if they said that all these perverts wouldn't use Snapchat. Exactly. Well, I think there should be this. Uh, I'm I'm really against censorship, um, but if my kid is faced with either having social media or having to deal with penises being sent to her, mm-hmm. there has to be some level of accountability, and I think that that's where we're that's where we're yep. we're stalemating right now because there it just doesn't make sense to me that. Out, everything I put on Facebook can be flagged, right? Anything I say. It, I said something, whose ass do I need to beat? And I got flagged, yep. right? I got mm-hmm. put in Facebook yeah. jail. But for some reason, some grown-ass man can send his phallic pictures mm-hmm. to your young child, and all of a sudden they have no no then, skin in the game. Yep. Then they throw up every damn roadblock you can absolutely imagine. Shame. And here's part of for the problem. For shame. In the state of Illinois... As an adult, 18 years or older, you can send a picture of your naked genitals to a minor, and it's a misdemeanor. Fuck that. Sorry for Mm. my language. Yes. Where our case went beyond was this individual, if you want to research it, you can find his name. Um, It's all on Muddy River News. Go ahead and check out our Search for my name, and you can probably find it as Mm -hmm. well. Um. He solicited sex from my daughter when he was on break from school. That was the felony. That's called grooming. That's a felony. Yeah. But sending pictures of your penis exposed, which wasn't very impressive, to my 13-year-old daughter. Let's reiterate that. That it was, was not a misdemeanor. Impressive. No. That, um, 
But this this That's case. That's what needs to change, though. Yes. How can you send pictures of your genitals to a minor and it's only a misdemeanor? Yeah. I can go outside and drink an open container of alcohol on the and sidewalk the in Quincy, and charge. it's a misdemeanor. Yeah. You can pee behind a dumpster and the- six blocks from a school and get labeled a sex offender for the rest of your life. Yes. But if okay. you have money and you hire high-priced attorneys, maybe you can weasel your way out of it. And therein lies a problem. Double standards. Yeah. Double standards. Exactly. Double standards. And, so, and, I will, and I will preface this and say, I was willing to take this plea bargain for one reason, to keep my daughter off stand, because I don't need some and that's jackass what it boiled down up there to. grilling my 13-year-old daughter and other juveniles over this incident. Yeah. It was absolutely inappropriate i think that you made the absolute right decision um he made it but he also let his daughter make that yeah because i told her it's it's your decision if we want to take this we can if you want to go up there and we'll fight this to the end we can but it was there comes a time where you've got to stop Mm -hmm. i could have seriously went we talked about how oh i know how do you go scorched earth you want me to ruin your life i can I can go all the way yeah. with this. And, a, and and that is what a dad should do for a daughter, no matter, like, yeah. I don't know. Like, I, I've heard some arguments behind this, and it really grosses me out when you wouldn't hear. I want to hear the dad say, I'm going scorched earth, because mm-hmm. just what I asked you before, why do you think she came to you? Because she trusts me. Yeah. Because I'm her protector. We need more I don't want to say, yeah, we need more men like that in this world to be the dads, the protectors. Um, my daughter was a product of something. Luckily, uh, m- my knight in shining armor came. The men, um, we need that, that male protection, that trust. And especially in a world where, uh, like, the male trust goes back. I know everyone's been seeing the whole, like, man versus bear debate. I don't know if oh, you yeah. heard that. Mm-hmm. That is a telling thing like I, I don't know you being the man that you are um where your daughter was able to come to you and, with such vulnerability too yeah. that's something really hard to do M- men need to look at this story at the whole bear versus man thing and listen like uh we need this in our world and we're lacking this in our world and i think this is a big problem i think there's a lot to be said for um masculinity and i'm not saying that this isn't going into the trans or the bi or whatever but i think when you have um when you have this opportunity to to show your children or your wife or people that you love that you're you're going to fight for them, mm-hmm. right? And whether that means at whatever extent they want you to or whatever extent I just uh, accidentally do, mm-hmm. right? You need someone to be like, this shit is not going to stand, dude. Mm-hmm. And I don't care if it's in the courts, in the family. If uh, it's It's nice to know. It's really nice to know that you have a relationship – a, with your daughter that is like, let's talk about this, but also that you can be like, tell me how far you want me to take it. Uh, I don't know that I would have that restraint. It's hard. I cannot even well, imagine there's it. There's a couple of things that, for one thing, a lot of fathers don't have that relationship yeah. with their daughter. My daughter and I are very, very close. Yeah. And I think part of it is when I disclose some of my past to her, she understands that there's trust nothing there that we can't talk about and i tell her that i don't care what it is we can talk about teenage girl stuff i may not understand all of it we can talk about 55 year old men shit and you probably won't understand that but we have a lot of fun conversations every morning i take her to school and we talk and we talk on the way back from school we have great conversations and and she's still a 14 year old teenager and she gives me the shit she's an a-hole all the time let's go ahead and throw that down there yeah they all are she says you're cringe oh i'm cringe all the time you're cringe oh yeah i tell her dad jokes and i do stuff i make tiktoks they don't yeah yeah, i don't care you know you know what this is the man that i am so one of the things that will probably stand out in both of our minds hers and mine for the rest of our lives is we had an argument it's been a couple months ago and She did the typical dad thing and said, Dad, you don't even love me. And I said, Courtney, Mm. 
I love you so much that I would die for you. Yeah. And we both just stopped. And that probably, and it was in the middle of all this shit with this dirt bag, Mm -hmm. probably one of the most defining moments in our relationship because I think she finally figured it out that I'm not just there to feed her and give her rides to school and give her money to go spend or so scold Florida her or, the or hell tell that her place what's is. going wrong. But yeah, yeah. I'm there to protect you, to teach you, to show you how to be a young lady, to show you that the man that you finally choose is going to appreciate you and treat you like a queen. Mm-hmm. That's what it's all about. And that's part of, I think some of the shit that we're missing now is these young ladies settle. They want to have a relationship with someone who doesn't appreciate them and, and, and their value. No, I'm going to teach you that you are an amazing young lady and whoever you end up with as a prom date in high school or someday going off to marry, they will appreciate you as a very strong, beautiful young woman and the value that you have. Yeah. And that's missing right now. It's missing a lot. I agree. That's uh, very, I'm going to start crying. Yeah, I know. But with daughters, it's, it is very profound, very necessary. I see it everywhere that it's like peer pressure or, so one of the things that I brought up to Britt was like, you know, my 13 year old is asking for Snapchat and she knows your daughter and everybody's has these like groups and things. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, absolutely not, dude. Makes me a bad mom, maybe. But I'm like, I just don't know. Uh, I just don't know. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying she's not mature enough because she's very, very mature. I just don't know. So Mm -hmm. in your, from your perspective, if you could do it all over again, right? Because a lot of this started on social media. Mm-hmm. What would you say to parents of uh, 12, 13-year-olds letting their kids have Snapchat, Facebook, TikTok? The problem with just all of those social media apps is our children are way more advanced in technology and social media than we will ever mm-hmm. be. Amen. So... When the door is opened and it's going to be opened, if they want to hide something from you, they will. There are if they want to do this, secrets. Mm-hmm. they're going to, whether you like it or not, whether you allow it or not. The peer pressure is out there that they need to communicate through these little apps and their streaks and all this other bullshit. They're going to do it whether you want to or not. That's not where you head off the problem. You hit off the problem way before that by having a relationship with your child and letting them understand the dangers and the risks that they pose in doing this. It doesn't have to be as extreme as what my family went through. It doesn't have to be going to court and dealing with sexual perverts and all this shit. But can I apologize and say that I've used that as not names? I've never used the name, but but I've used that as... Absolutely. But it can also be, think about this, you're going to go off to college or trade school or whatever the fact may be. I own a ton of real estate in this town. I'm a landlord. The first thing I do is look someone up and I want to see what kind of life they live. If I look and, you know, there's, you know, they're a disaster at home because they're taking selfies and all I see in the background is a bunch of shit. I'm not going to rent yeah. yeah. it. And- Back in the day when I owned a my GIS the company, mirror. yes, and it, the mirror's not the mirror's not take... clean, but behind it is really not clean. Yes. But when I owned my GIS company and I was hiring employees and all that stuff, that would be the first place I'd look. I want to know, are you like actually a responsible person or yeah. are you just going to come in here and fly by night and tear through my shit and go on to the next person? So in essence, kids will be kids, but it is definitely up to the parents to checks and balance, uh, make sure that you're involved, make sure you're yeah. having the right conversations. And that's remember so that, that obvious, stuff but does then, not go away, though. They, yeah. That's one thing they have to remember. I know. Their whole Facebook page that they usually start when they're 13, 14 years old, the that shit doesn't go Nothing away. Nothing disappears. So teach them, and like I want to close on this. Yeah. Teach them how to maintain a good reputation. Yes, and be responsible. Yeah. And be responsible. I mean, yeah. that's like the Think biggest. Think about 10 years ahead of if you. If you don't want bias against you, mm-hmm. then have, you know, a good upstanding reputation and that 
a lot of times comes from good people, good parents like you, you know, it comes from yep. the base, but if, if that's not the case, we've seen in your story, in the Shane story, change, change can happen. It can happen. And a lot of times it takes these kids going through some of these horrible things that not like what my daughter went through, but like, you know, you're going to go out and apply for a job. They're going to turn you down because they saw a picture of you doing beer bongs last week. Mm -hmm. You know, no one wants to see that shit. When you're trying to be a professional, be a professional. If you want to go out and get an engineering degree and, you know, go on to be a really professional, you can't have all this dirty baggage all over your damn social media yep. for the past 10 years. Yep. No, and look how many needs. athletes deal with that. And also not just athletes, but some of these people are getting into government and professional jobs. Mm -hmm. All this shit comes back to haunt them. The way you stop that is don't be a douchebag early on yep. and you don't have to deal with your reputation is there a douchebag 10 years from now. And hashtag don't, hashtag don't be a douche. Yeah, and watch your social media. <laughs> yes. yeah. Amen. Yes. Cheers. So, uh, Shane, I want to say thank you for uh, welcome, welcoming us into your awesome yet unbelievable story. Uh, this is really cool. Thank you Thanks for, for being this so personal and upfront, too. This was so oh, freaking cool. That's been my life, and yeah. it's not over yet. <laughs> <laughs>